Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Happy to see a uh, room and people on Zoom. Delighted to be chairing this event, at which we have a privilege, the privilege of hosting. Well, hosting is not quite right, because he's one of us, but uh, this evening I get to host him. Uh, our friend and professor of practice at the School of Public Policy, Servin Scable, whom, as you know, will be presenting, launching, and speaking about his book, how to be a politician, 2,000 years of good, parenthesis, and bad advice. Um, before joining the School of Public Policy and the LSE, of course, uh, Vince was an MP for Twickenham in the southwest of London for 20 years. He was a leader of the uh, Lib Dems in uh, Parliament, and he also served as a member of the coalition cabinet. So he has not only a long, but a distinguished and influential career in politics. And he's been talking, I know, to lots of SPP students who, um, some of them confess it outright, some of them don't, are thinking about being a politician. Um, I used to be a politician, so believe me, I look upon such hopes with uh, a great deal of enthusiasm. Um, I'm sure Vince will describe his book uh, uh, in detail, um, but uh, let me just read two lines from the opening blurb of the book so you get a taste of what it is that we're going to hear about today. Uh, from cradle to grave, these pages follow the arc of a life in politics, from childhood signs of potential to running for office, getting elected, forming a government, ascending the greasy pole to the pinnacle of leadership and a place on the world stage, dealing with mistakes, detractors, criticism, humiliation, and failure. And finally, escaping the political life altogether. Although I might add, I don't think one ever escapes the political life altogether. I, I believe me, I have tried and I have failed miserably. So we're going to hand it over to uh, Vince Cable. Uh, for a presentation of the book. Then I'm going to take uh, the chair's privilege and ask a few questions. And of course, then we will open it up to a conversation both uh, with people in the room and people over Zoom. Let me add before Carolina scolds me that this is an SPP uh, public event and we're holding plenty of other public events. And I'm going to just mention them before I forget. Uh, there's one on Wednesday the 16th uh, on the global trading system at 5 p.m. There's the LSE Fudan, Fudan University in Shanghai annual conference uh, on Thursday the 17th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. There is an event on the social contract and the constitution in Chile uh, on Wednesday the 23rd from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And a big, big event to which you are all in, uh, in, invited, I was going to say invented, invited, uh, uh, it is the annual lecture held by the SPP and our guest is Annie Minton Beddows, the editor-in-chief of The Economist, who will be discussing a small topic, this will be interested, the future of liberalism. Um, I hope there is a future for liberalism, but I am very much looking forward to hearing what Zani has to say. So plenty of events. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you guys at one of those in addition to tonight's event. So without further ado, Vince, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for writing the book and for bringing the book to us tonight. Yes, well, thank you, Andres. Um, let, me get, let me just say a little bit at the beginning about the book. It's not a major political philosophy, not a major textbook. It's um, rather tongue in cheek. I've written a narrative about the nature of being a politician, um, but it's integrated with a big collection of quotations. And I, I, it's, it's for fun as much as learning. Um, I'm going to talk my way through this agenda uh, trustworthiness. Why is it that politicians are held in such a low esteem? I, my book opens with an introduction. Uh, where I'm engaged in a conversation with a young person who says, I want to be a politician, to which my response is, really? <laughs> and take it from there. There's something about what 
politics involves the background. And then the core of what I want to talk about is item six, which is levels of skill that you need to become a candidate, a representative, a parliamentarian, a minister, a kind of escalating level of skill, if you like. And then before we forget, getting out is um, not straightforward. But before I do that, I just, um, I, I will put up some, uh, actually, I think quite beautiful slides, some of them. Uh, I haven't done them. I, I, as 20 years in the House of Commons, you don't make PowerPoint presentations in the House of Commons. So I've relied very heavily on the skills of Asan Ghani, who's over there, um, who's uh, done a wonderful job for me. Um, so thank him rather than me, if you like the, like the slide. Let me just start with what people think about us. Um, there was a textbook for politics students when I was an undergraduate many years ago. And one of the core texts was Bernard Crick. I don't know whether you still refer to it, but there's no end of praises that can be sung of politicians. The whole art of politics is just fundamental to the way democracy works. Uh, and then Pericles, who addresses um, the abstainers. So basically, because you don't take any interest in politics doesn't mean that politics won't take an interest in you. <laughs> the politicians do stuff that affects you. Um, the British Brexit referendum, I think, was a wonderful example of the politics of selective abstention. You know, if the, if the voting turnout of the young had been the same as the voting turnout of the elderly, it would have gone the other way, probably. So it's it, politics is engagement. Uh, and then finally, I've got a quote from the Glaswegian uh, comedian. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who expresses a desire to be a politician should be banned for life from ever becoming one, mm -hmm. which I think is very much the public mood. Mm -hmm. uh, and I start with Billy Connolly because he was starting his career as a uh, comedian in, in Glasgow when I started my political career in Glasgow as a city politician um, helping to run the city in my in my 20s and we we overlapped but the, the the Billy Connolly view I think is perfectly captured in this chart um, this is a survey that was done in 23 countries I mean you can understand why in Britain may people may have a rather jaundiced view of politicians but this is 23 countries everything from Main countries of Western Europe, South America, Africa, even China. I'm not quite sure what a Chinese politician is, but um, and it's an aggregate, of a vast online survey of how you trust different professions. And it's fairly predictable up at the top. I mean, you know, doctors and engineers and scientists, uh, teachers, even the police and the army, you know, we generally have a positive view about them. Uh, and indeed, the ordinary citizen, people are generally pretty positive about how they see their fellow citizens. But then you go down to the negatives and some fairly predictable ones, bankers, <laughs> journalists, advertising executives, but right at the bottom are politicians. In all these countries combined, the view of politicians is strikingly negative. People make a bit of distinction between ministers who do things and politicians who grab for votes, but nonetheless, it's it's right at the bottom of the of the pile. Uh, but before going on to you know why that is, um, just this this is a something you might want to look at the the Edelman Trust Indicator. It's how people trust government. Of course, this isn't just politicians. Government is also bureaucracy but it sort of ranks uh, by country. Um, and there's some, in a way, fairly predictable. You'd expect authoritarian countries, China, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates to be quite high up. I mean, why, people are not going to answer a survey by slugging off their government, but um, and anyway, they're reasonably efficient. Um, and slightly odd ones, India is right up at the top. I mean, India is a wonderful democracy, but rather corrupt and turbulent, but people value it, trust it, extraordinary way. Um, and Indonesia, another populist and rather turbulent democracy. Um, and you've got Russia at the bottom, which is perhaps not surprising. I don't understand why Japan is so low. I don't know a great deal about Japan, but always struck me as being a fairly well-run 
uh, and honest place, but maybe I'm wrong. But I mean, the key point about this is to is look at the position of the main Western democracies, the United States, the UK, uh, many European countries, very low down on the table. The, a majority of people do not trust their government and the politicians who rule over them. And that's the context in which uh, we have to think of a political career. And these are some of the reasons why. Um, I mean, the very nature of politics is about compromise. You, you know, you go into election, you make promises. Um, and one of the quotes in my book, the only people bound by campaign pledges are the voters who believe in them. You know, in the real world, you know, you get into government, uh, you have to make difficult decisions, you have to backtrack, you have to work with your stakeholders, with the opposition. In this particular picture here, it's taken in India. Um, and the particularly uh, dodgy assortment of individuals in the state of Bihar, which was which is famous in India for the poor quality of the politicians, over half of the people in the state legislature. And this is a state that has a population of Germany and France combined, uh, are criminals. You know, they're involved in murder, rape, kidnapping, but they've got into parliament in order to avoid prosecution. So it's not a particularly elevated place, but um, there they are forming a coalition. Uh, and it's a sort of the grubbiness of compromise, the fact that politics inherently involves stepping back from what you've campaigned on. And then we have standards. This is the party gate, which you may remember, Boris Johnson, his colleagues, um, observing the COVID restrictions with a, a drink after work. Um, and then populist cynicism, um, it's a bit dark, but that's Donald Trump and Nigel Farage, two particularly good examples of that approach to politics. Um, and Trump, I think, an example of something we see a lot of now, which is what I would call plutocratic populism. Uh, and a good way of defining it is that politics is getting the votes of the poor and money from the rich by promising to protect the one from the other. Um, it's you know, the interests of the super rich and the poor at the same time. And on the right, I've got pictures of our recently departed Prime Minister, uh, Ms. Truss, because doing is harder than saying. You know, she campaigned for four months in, on television, you probably saw some of it, all the things that she was going to do if she became leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister, tried to put it into practice, and we had an economic collapse. You know, doing is harder than saying. And of course, this brings politics into even more disrepute. Um, what, what I discuss in the book is this distinction between what I call priests and plumbers. You know, priests are people who are very good at making speeches, they're very eloquent, they have a way with words. Uh, they're marvelously charismatic. I suppose Obama is probably the best example we've had in recent years. But the plumbers are the people who actually do stuff, make things happen, difficult. Not many politicians are good at it. Probably the most famous plumber in modern times was LBJ in America. Thought to be a thoroughly unpleasant man, terribly crude and nasty but he pushed through legislation, managed to make things happen. I'm not sure we have many good plumbers in Britain, but uh, I was in the government with Michael Gove, uh, one of the cabinet ministers, um, you know, good at fixing things. So all these things together, you know, the inability to deliver the cynicism of the populace, poor standards, the grubbiness of compromise, all add together to why you have this kind of popular cynicism and dissent from um, a political life, even in democracies, which are well established. Right, let me go back to the issue of, you know, how do you become a politician? Well, I think the starting point is that background matters. Um, I've got on the left the uh, Bush family in the United States that produced um, two presidents, uh, and before that, senators and a wide variety of people. The Bush family, you know about the Kennedys, 
uh, the Rockefellers before that. This has become less common, but you know there are political dynasties. We found out in India, you know everything from um, you know the, the Gandhi family. I think five generations now, and it does does happen. Uh, the UK, not so much, but we had one great dynasty, which is the Churchills, which ended in 2019 when the last of the Churchill family, Nicholas Soames, stood down from Parliament. But successive generations of people uh, in the same family. Um, more important is education. Uh, one of the features about the British political system is I think something like 7% of the population go to independent schools, but it's in the last parliament, I think 27% are to independent schools. Um, within that, um, you've got a, an elite within an elite. Um, larger numbers of former British of prime ministers have been at Eton, uh, including several recent ones. Uh, Boris Johnson and uh, Cameron were the latest. Um, and in addition to the elite schools, you have universities. Um, very, very high percentage of the British Parliament are now university graduates, probably over 80%, I think, uh, and a significant percentage of those from Oxford. Um, it may be different next time if you get a left-wing government, less likely to be the case, but that is, uh, that's common. And, and these things are accentuated the further you get up. Uh, when I served in the cabinet, I think 65% of my colleagues were in being a private school. Most of them had been to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, very high percentage had been to Eton. So you have that elite phenomenon. Um, and one of the things it's led to is a, a disappearing working class. There's very, very few politicians in the UK, and I think this is probably true of other Western democracies, very few of them have worked with their hands. Uh, in factories, if you, 20 years ago, you'd still encounter miners and factory workers, now very, very rare. What is more, uh, we're getting a lot more women. It was actually quite rare when I became an MP, very small minority. We still haven't got 50%, but we have you know, significant number of women prime ministers in Europe, Australasia. Um, the importance of a political background is having a backstory. I don't know anybody who recognizes this uh, woman here, but that's Angela Rayner, who is the deputy leader of the Labour Party in the UK, uh, deputy to Starmer, um, and has, even before she opens her mouth, has a wonderful backstory. Uh, she left school at 15 to care for her mother who had mental illness. Uh, she was pregnant when she left school, brought up a single family, uh, went to work in a shop, was a, was a brilliant organiser, became a recognised trade union official, very effective, and scooped up by the Labour Party as an MP and then shot to the top. So backstory is, in, is an important element of a you know, political career. Um, one, one element, this uh, handsome young man is me, actually, 50 years ago, um, speaking in the Cambridge Union, and a very, very high percentage of leading politicians started life um, in the debating union at Oxford or Cambridge, or Glasgow, which is actually probably better than both. Uh, and most top Scottish politicians went through their debating unions and learned those sort of basic debating skills. Um, but to summarize, you know, why do we get the wrong politicians? An interesting book by a woman called Isabel Hardman, who you know, breaks down the background of a lot of people entering British politics. And in the Labour Party, I think half of all MPs are former researchers, political organizers, full-time local government councillors, um, in other words, half of them have never had a proper job. Uh, and that includes people at the top of the party. Stalin was a serious lawyer, but, but many of the other people uh, have never done anything else but be a politician. Tory party, it's not much lower, about a third, I think. So that's, that's why background matters. Then one of the key decisions you have to make in political life, obviously, is choosing what side you're on. 
And in the UK, you know, we've had three parties over 200 years, only three parties, numerous attempts at breakaways, the SDP, and then Change UK a few years ago. But they never get anywhere under the first past the post system. So three basic parties. Um, I've just chosen three quotes. You could probably get better ones, but um, an absolute monarchy tempered by regicide is a good description of the Conservative Party. We've seen two acts of regicide in the last year. Um, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss have been effectively assassinated by their party. Um, and Harold Wilson, former Prime Minister, leader of the Labour Party, it's like a stagecoach, you rattle along at great speed. Everybody's too exhausted or too seasick to cause trouble. But if you stop, everybody gets out and argues about where to go next. <laughs> I think that captures the, um, the way the party function. Then my party, um, but this was a comment 100 years ago, uh, there's no benefit to gain by being a liberal today. It's not profitable or remunerative career. <laughs> He's making the point that if you only have a small number of MPs, you know, the chances of making a career are rather difficult. But, but being a, making a choice um, is actually not straightforward. Um, because although um, the public frequently change their mind, we have lots of floating voters, um, politicians don't. There are very, very few people who change party. Will Winston Churchill was an exception. He started life as a conservative went to the Liberals um, in a protest over racism. Actually, this was 1904, objected to the racial racialism in the British Aliens Act, which was designed to keep out Jewish people, uh, polling legislation. Uh, joined the Liberals, was a very enlightened, radical minister for 20 years, but then went back to the Conservatives, and you know the story of the war leader and so on. Um, so not many people change. I'm one of the few. I used to be Labour and I changed to the Liberal Democrats. But this trust was a Liberal Democrat, became a Conservative, but very few people change. Uh, and I think as Churchill himself put it, uh, ratting is straightforward, but re-ratting calls for a certain amount of ingenuity. He was, I think, the only person I can recall who has ever done it. So once you choose a party, you're pretty much settled in it for the 50 odd years or whatever potentially you have in a career. Um, but then you've got the basic skills that you've got to acquire. And I just, I've, got, I've done this in sort of three stages. Um, the first step, which most people don't pay too much attention to, but it's absolutely fundamental, which is actually getting adopted as a candidate somewhere to fight a seat in parliament or whatever legislature you're trying to get into. Uh, not at all easy. You know, understanding a party machine, you know, who controls what, who sets the rules for the selection, the appeals process, <clears throat> and a very high percentage of very talented politicians just fall by the wayside because they don't get to grips with their party machine. They can't get themselves adopted as a candidate. And understanding political machines is the first step on your, in your process of getting adopted. And then if you get adopted as a candidate, and fight a seat, you haven't got elected yet, um, you're managing large teams of volunteers. As an MP, for example, um, before I became an MP, I had to organize about 300 people to deliver leaflets every month or two. It sounds easy, but actually you've got to get these people motivated year after year after year, give them some hope. You're going to win. You're not paying them anything. So um, managing volunteers, fundraising. Britain is not like the United States. You, you don't have to pay vast sums in primaries, but um, being a candidate, in a winnable seat is very, very expensive. Somebody estimated at the last election, I think they traced a couple of Labour uh, candidates who didn't get in, and it probably cost them about 100, 100K. You know, sacrifice of salary, um, supporting local parties, this kind of thing. It is an expensive business. Um, Self-promotion, having a family that's willing to put up with you for years on end, doing going away from the children and uh, spending your time knocking on doors. Um, 
And the two things I emphasize more than any other is just luck. Vast numbers of potential politicians just fall by the wayside because they're in the wrong party in the wrong place at the wrong time. Luck, massively important. And patience, you know, a willingness to stick with it even when you've lost. I mean, I, I got into Parliament at the fifth attempt after 30 years. Now, that is a bit extreme. Um, but, you know, had I given up, you know, it would have just disappeared. And just a little story behind this picture. This is um, me being a candidate uh, with the then party leader, uh, trying to whip up support in my local area. But there is an ugly side to that because um, my local party had decided they wanted to get rid of me. Um, I had just done very well in the 1992 election. We were going to probably win the next time. And so suddenly a lot of bright, young, ambitious politicians saw a honeypot and headed towards it. Mm -hmm. And they decided, or some of them, that they would try to evict the sitting candidate, which is me. And I wasn't doing very much. My wife had cancer and I had a very demanding job, so I wasn't working very hard. So I then had to do what politicians have to do, you know, resort to a bit of bare knuckle stuff. So. Uh, one of my organisers organised, I think, 15 elderly ladies from the local bingo club, paid their membership. We hired a bus, um, various other people from an old folks home who were dragged along. They hadn't a clue what they were going to do, except they had been <coughs> given some instructions about how to vote X at the right time in the right place. And in a, in a mass meeting of about 400 people, I survived by two votes. And had I lost, I, I would now probably be a retired Shell executive playing golf in Malaga. <laughs> yeah, never, never have heard of me, but, but I won. And um, But there was a happy ending generally because the, the guy I defeated is now leader of the party. He got there by a different route. Um, and the lady who organised my uh, under, underground activity, we, we managed to get made a baroness. So it, it, all, finished, it all finished well. Um, um, this is the middle level, right? You're in parliament, you've become, a, you, you've actually won your election, you're no longer a candidate, but you've now got to develop a whole new set of skills. Um, you're now managing professional teams, the people who work in your office, in your constituency, the people who support you in parliament, researchers, and press officers, and so on. Um, at the same time, you're doing a lot of what you could call social work. If you're a conscientious MP, you're there once or twice a week meeting residents who've got block drains, asylum applications, housing problems, and so on. Um, multitasking, you know, you're doing national legislation, local campaigning, looking after constituents, um, scrutinizing government, you know, very complex role. Um, so a lot of prioritization. Um, I would stress networking. You've got to, you know, you're building up a network of allies. If you're going to push up to the next <laughs> stage, you need supporters, right? Um, and then speaking in parliament, I put that bottom because actually, although we like to romanticize parliamentary oratory, um, the level of speaking in certainly our parliament, and probably true in others too, is absolutely lamentable. Um, if you go there at 10 o'clock at night and listen to MP speaking, you'll find that most of them are, you know, like they're not grand oratory. They are sort of reading from a speech which has been written for them by their researcher. And it's not very inspiring stuff. And actually, I've always heeded the advice of Disraeli mm -hmm. that it's better that people wonder why you don't speak than why you do. Mm -hmm. Because the quality of a lot of what he said is often pretty bad. Yeah. And then the final stage this is cabinet. That was the coalition cabinet, plus a few people who were attending, but not members of it. Um, and this was the coalition government 2010, and you see in the middle David Cameron and Nick Clegg, who were the joint leaders. I'm somewhere at the back. Um, but you, you now require, if, if, if you, you know, get a serious, serious cabinet job, if you're secretary of state for a, a major department, mine, business innovation skills, 
education, social security, housing, local government, defense, foreign affairs. These are big, big operations. And you need a completely new set of skills. You know, how, how do you oversee and motivate large organizations? Really? I mean, in my case, I arrived in the cabinet. I was already aged 60, um, 60 odd, 68. Uh, and I'd never been in charge of any group of people larger than about five or six. And then the following day, I was in charge of a million. Um, and working out how you communicate with them, how you motivate them. I had five years to learn, but a lot of cabinet ministers are only there for six months. Um, you know, a big skill. And then having a core loyal team, the people around you who make it possible to be an effective minister. Quite, a, quite an art. Um, the key people in certainly modern British politics are what are called special advisors. They're embedded in the civil service, but they're political. Um, they were, were, I think, defined as like, like poisoners. They're either famous or good at their jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they do the dirty political work to, to help you be effective. And what I call multi-level tasking, I mean, really quite demanding. You're dealing with parliament, the media, your own colleagues in the cabinet, your party colleagues, your local party, and you're constantly switching from one to the other and communicating in a different way. Then what I rather cynically call mistake management, <coughs> because a lot of politics involves making mistakes. Right? And success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. That was Churchill. Um, you know, sometimes, like this man Williamson in the present government, you make so many mistakes, it just becomes blindingly obvious and they have to kick you out. But... Good politicians know how to pass the blame to their colleagues or the, the, the people who work for them or the people above them. Uh, there's a, an expression, finding a good time to bury bad news, uh, learning how to diffuse major um, catastrophes by setting up an inquiry that then takes 10 years to complete. Um, and then I would say at the bottom, learning to kill or be killed. I don't mean physically, but rhetorically. Um, and some of the most effective um, and damaging lines in politics are um, people who destroyed their opponent just with a phrase. Um, one I particularly like from the 19th century was, was Disraeli, who was a master of this. And he was faced with a liberal leader against him, Lord Russell. Uh, and he said, when I begin to understand how the opposition made the right honorable gentleman its leader, I begin to understand how the ancient Egyptians has worshiped an insect. <laughs> and Lloyd George was a, another was a great liberal leader, beginning of the century, really status of Churchill in many ways, but a brutal man. Um, it was said um, he, never see, he never saw a belt without wanting to hit below it. Uh, and, um, uh, there were people of that kind. When I looked at the collection of quotes I was given, um, I, I, I only mer merited one entry, which was because of a rather cruel comment I made about Gordon Brown, which was particularly unfortunate in a way, because he was a friend, and I rather admired him. Uh, but anyway, it, it sort of went down in history as something that sort of wounded this uh, prime minister who was then already somewhat on the ropes. Anyway, let me conclude with this, and then we'll hopefully throw it open, deal with questions. An important part of politics is knowing how to get out of it. You know, you don't get a gold watch, you don't become an emeritus professor, you know, what's your exit? Um, and it can be bad. Um, um, Liz Truss here, def defeat and humiliation. You know, she may buy the SPAC in five years' time, who knows, but at the moment... It looks as if she will go down as Britain's worst prime minister or perhaps second worst prime minister. Um, we've got Boris Johnson, Hester La Vista. There's some politicians who will never go. Um, he wants to come back. So does Donald Trump. So does um, um, Italy. Um, sorry, I've forgotten the name. Berlusconi, Berlusconi back in the cabinet, age 90 plus. You know, some people um, just hang around and want to come back. 
some people become an elder statesman, that's Gordon Brown, um, gives good advice on issues, you know, passionately felt issues, overseas development, British constitutional change. Um, and I put the House of Lords um, I, I, with slight reservations. I mean, the, the British House of Lords used to be seen as a good vehicle for retiring elderly politicians with some dignity. Um, and many of them are very elderly. There was a rather cruel comment by an MP recently who said it's a, an ermine-lined dustbin, uh, an upmarket geriatric home smelling vaguely of urine. Uh, it's actually worse than that because they've started bringing in young people, but mostly young people who are bag carriers for um, politicians, not achieved anything necessarily. Um, or more commonly, it's a reward for giving money to a political party. I mean, I, I, I discovered the true role of the House of Lords when I was party leader, and this rather famous businessman came up to me and he said, look, I've just given £2 million to Mr Cameron, and he hasn't delivered the peerage. Can you do any better, he said. And I have to tell him, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I don't have any peerages and I wouldn't give you one anyway. But he did get his peerage, actually, six months later from Mr Cameron. Did he give um, more millions? I think the going rate is two to three. It's supposed to be a criminal offence, but, you know, who knows? Um, another two resign in disgrace is this, um, the gentleman who... Uh, was collecting consultancy fees, Owen Patterson, um, uh, who resigned in the by-election which my party won. You may remember that, North Shropshire. Um, he, was, he actually became famous for one of his pronouncements when he was a cabinet minister. He was in charge of culling badgers, and the badgers refused to be culled. You know, they're smart animals. And he... he put out a sort of protest note complaining that the badgers were moving the goalposts. Um, anyway, he, he finished up in disgrace. Um, there's Mr. Cameron joining the gravy train, uh, becoming a consultant to uh, Mr. Greenhill, I think he was called, and Tony Blair, who I call the political entrepreneur, who sells advice, gets well paid for it, but is a respected voice on political affairs. There's a bit of overlap between these two categories, I think. And then finally, um, of course, there is death, and some people die prematurely, and they leave politics with a good reputation. I've featured here John Smith, who was often described as the best prime minister we never had. I knew him because I worked for him as a special advisor for a while, um, and I went recently when I was on holiday to a, um, the island of Iona, which is off the west coast of Scotland, where he's buried in a very atmospheric graveyard. Um, and the inscription on his tomb, um, I think it's from Alexander Pope originally, um, that uh, an honest man is the noblest work of God. Um, and if you know people say that about when you left politics, I guess you cannot do any better than that. But that's only one of the exit routes, and I'm afraid the others are worse. <laughs> Maybe that's a cue to discuss. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was fun. It was enlightening and had wisdom, but also plenty of good anecdotes. And if you read the book, you will find plenty of good quotes. I, I thought I knew uh, a, a, a quote or two of politics, but there's a plethora here of quotes I had never come across. Um, that, among many other things, makes the book uh, recommendable. Uh, I have two or three questions which, which uh, are prompted by your remarks, Vince, also by my experience in politics. One is you, know, you describe the kinds of skills that a successful politician needs. And I can't think of any other job where in the course of one morning or one afternoon, and I'm quoting here, you have to have a chat with a constituent whose drain is blocked. Um, 
you know, having been a politician, I can tell you that's not a metaphor. Uh, people do approach you, and sometimes, you know, if you're a sitting MP, uh, you have to have meetings with people whose pensions were not paid, whose paperwork was lost, whose, you know, dentures did not arrive in time, uh, um, or whose drains are blocked. And from that, you go to parliament and you make a speech or you go to a cabinet meeting and you take some important decisions or, you know, you're in foreign affairs, you fly up to the UN and you meet foreign dignitaries. Um, so, you know, in most jobs, if you, you know, if you'd remain a shell and, you know, been an oil engineer, that requires a set of skills, but a fairly narrow set of skills. In politics, the range of skills is incredibly broad. Given that, what what did you find in your in your years in politics that was sort of the, the the sine qua non, the, the the skills that you must have if you're going to be a successful politician? Um, I don't think there is a single point. I mean, as I explained on the book, uh, I think when you're at the top level, you, you are in this business of what I call multi-level tasking, which you've just described very well. Um, I mean, I, I I had been a you know reasonably successful opposition politician, achieved a certain amount of fame from notoriety during the financial crisis. Uh, but then one day, um, I was told I was put in charge of one of the biggest departments in government, all universities, all colleges, all government scientists, um, all postmen. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> You know, you're, 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 you're fundamentally changing your scale. I, I think one of the things I would argue is, 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 is that you do need time, actually. And we've got into this, certainly in the UK, the, this kind of cycle of rapidly changing governments, rapidly changing ministries. Right. Um, I remember under the Labour government, the, there was a very competent minister called Dr John Reid, uh, who was one of nature's plums. Mm -hmm. he, he did things. He was right. good. So Tony Blair would move him from one department to another every six months uh, without mastering any of the detail of what the department did. But um, So you do, if you're going to do the job properly, you, you, know, you do need time. I, I would argue that although I came into politics very late, I mean, I became an MP when I was 55, and almost 70 before I became a cabinet minister, is that actually using that time to develop a career, have a family, do different things, you know, you, you acquire sort of a way of looking at the world which is much richer than if you were a professional politician, typically who's gone to university, got worked for an MP for three years, stood as a hopeless seat and then stood again, you've got a very narrow range of, of skill and understanding. So, so I don't, if there's a single thing, I would say time, uh, patience, uh, you know, and building up skills over time is probably the crucial thing. So that's one important bit of advice, have a life before you become a politician. Um, you know, it, it does give you skills. I would add, it probably gives you an exit route because if you've only had a life of a politician, if you want to leave politics, where do you go? You haven't been anywhere else. Whereas if you've had a life elsewhere, you can return to that life, your friends, your contacts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You spoke of, uh, of priests and plumbers. Um, and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that distinction. Yeah, I suppose the great, great, great leaders are a bit of both. Um, yeah. You know, they're they're inspiring speakers, uh, but they can also sit there at 3 a.m. and negotiate a bill and they know their briefs, et cetera, et cetera. But many great politicians are not. Um, you know, uh, some are great speakers, but 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 terrible negotiators. And they don't read their big red boxes or in other countries, I suppose, the boxes are of different color. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the plumbers are very necessary, but uh, they're not inspiring. After a, a term or two in Parliament, maybe they lose their jobs. Um, can one be both? Should one choose one of the two? Um, what is your what is your thinking on that? Well, ideally, you should yeah. you should have both. It's difficult to think of many examples of people who did. I suppose, in a way, Tony Blair. Yeah. Who was um, he? Wasn't a great orator, but he, he, he particularly on television, yeah. uh, mastered the art of kind of communicating empathy. 
and a very good way with words, a sort of cadence is that, that, that were eloquent, uh, but at the same time was a very good operator, um, knew how to manage people to a close interest in detail, and it, you know, his reputation was destroyed by one big bad mistake, which is the Iraq war, but if, had it not been for that, we would be thinking of him as one of the greats, right? Yeah, there are a few people. I, I suppose in the US, Bill Clinton also fit in that mode, right? Yeah. Very good with policy, knew every last bit. But, you know, if you put him in a room with a bunch of other politicians, he could certainly hold his own. Yes, Clinton and uh, Obama both. Well, actually, Obama, Obama was brainy, but Obama was not entirely a good negotiator. Yeah, he was yeah. uh, he was aloof, and he got, he, got, he got attacked, in fact, for being aloof. Mm, yes, exactly. Um, I have a couple more thoughts. One, I'm hoping to get you to speculate more on why it is that politicians are so reviled. Uh, and of course they are, uh, that, that's a fact of life, but there are two sort of attenuating circumstances uh, on which I'd like to get your, your thoughts. Um, one is not, you know, in, in, in that, in that, uh, in that uh, list that you showed, you had members of cabinet and then you had politicians, meaning probably members of parliament in, 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 in the British world. But, um, you know, there are politicians who are also other things, like mayors, for instance. Yeah, yeah. And I think it is a fact in most surveys across the world that people don't necessarily like members of parliament because it's a talking shop and people distrust people who talk to once. Uh, voters do. However, mayors get a very different kind of uh, reception because they're perceived as people actually do things. You know, they, they unblock your drain, to go back to your example. Is there maybe a, a, a clue there? I mean, maybe politicians are perceived as doers will be hated less. So that's one thought. The other thought is, you know, every so many years in every country, including this one, um, you know, there's sort of a revolution against the perceived political establishment. You know, people say, uh, you know, kick them all out, uh, get them all out of power, send them all home. And of course, a different class of politicians comes in, and within five years, people feel exactly the same, uh, which maybe simply reveals that the people who come to power are all terrible, or maybe simply reveals the fact that voters are very naive because they, they, they're they hoping to find in politicians something that you uh, are not going to find because inevitably when you have lots of problems and you promise to solve them all, you're going to solve just a small subset of the problem. So, you know, a job of the politician is to disappoint. If you're, you're not disappointing large numbers of people. You know, George Orwell once said that he was, when he was an imperial policeman in Burma, that. Only once in my life was I important enough to be hated by large numbers of people. I suppose the, the analog in politics is, you know, only once in my life was I important enough to disappoint large, large numbers of people. That's what you do as a politician. You're elected on a big platform, you make 25 promises, you know, with luck you get to fulfill three. Um, so how, you know, are we stuck with that? Uh, are, are politicians to blame or maybe are voters to blame? Well, I like the latter point, actually. Uh -huh. um, people get the governments they deserve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a strong uh -huh. element. But, but let me take through your point. I think that the, the local bigger picture distinction is quite important. And it's important for several reasons. Um, I mean, I talked about politicians rather lazy than just the national legislature. But, of course, the, you know, if, you, if you're in India or Germany or the United States, you know, Federal level politicians are very, very important. Um, in the UK, um, not so, because they have virtually no autonomy, whatever, uh, we have a highly centralized state. But I guess if you are the mayor of Manchester, sure, sure. Um, you have as much authority as a cabinet minister, probably. Um, and if you're in a village, you know, more autonomy. Yeah, more autonomy. You know, even being a kind of village. Uh, parish council, you know, and if you're arguing the very local issue about local parking and whatever, you know, local oh, politics can be very, very local and yeah. important to the people who participate in it. So I was a bit lazy in just talking about one level. I don't think there's any evidence that local councillors, for example, in local government are more trusted than yeah. national politicians. I'd be surprised if they are. But mayors are. Mm -hmm. the, the doers. Right? Yes, to a point. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I think the national local thing works in a different way. So I think one of the things we've realized is that politicians are disliked and distrusted as a class, but not as individuals. Right? Uh, and, and this first struck me as, as personally because I, I, I used to be terrified of going around knocking on doors 
um, and saying, you know, I'm Vince Cable, I'm your candidate or your MP, will you be voting for me? I, I thought there's a terribly thing to do, but I read, read in the papers, you know, politicians are distrusted, hating. Yeah. So I, I thought this is going to be a terrible, but I was amazed when I started going around how it was wonderful to see you. We've never seen a politician before. How amazing you've come to see me. This is fantastic. Uh, and all kind of quotes, you know, about that wonderful local MP. Uh, and I thought I was being rather special and rather clever, but then all my colleagues said that they had the same experience. Um, and I, I think what happens is that when you've been identified, with an individual politician who makes some difference in your life, however minor, you contrast that with the, the blob, you know, the aggregate, this uh, um, mass of people who are doing unsavory, unsavory things. Um, sorry, so the, the, the last point was the... Just remind me of the, the first one was, was the local versus the national. The second one was... Uh, I've got myself now. Um, does anybody remember? Somebody must. Never mind. Somebody must have been listening. Um, okay, well, I, I, I will. I will. I will remember. I'm sure. I have two more questions, and I will open it up. Um, first, uh, a reaction to what you just said. It is absolutely true that the actual experience of knocking on doors is different. Very different to what people tell you it will be like. Now, I was a minister in the middle of a financial crisis. And I made it a point to go, you know, meet real people and knock on their doors every Friday. And my advisor said, you're crazy. Then, you know, they will, they will throw rotten things at you. And uh, nobody ever did, um, which is partially simply because the fact that a senior politician shows up in your neighborhood is viewed as, oh, this person can't be so bad. You know, he's, he's not in parliament. He's not in, you know, in some, in, some, in some very important government building. Here he is at the local market, at the local shop, et cetera. Which suggests, by the way, that people have a... You know, the ideal politician in many voters' minds is a politician who's you know, out of the street, taking people's hands all day long. Problem is, if you do that, you're never governing. Um, so, you know, uh, polit politicians who are viewed as close to people get kudos, they get more votes. Uh, they, they're not very effective. Yeah, so, sorry. I, uh, yeah. I remembered your other question. All right, somebody did. Oh, good. Which is about, you know, if we get bad politicians with the bad reputation, of course. is it their fault or is it the public? The uh, government, you know, and we get the government that people deserve. Yeah, and, and, and there must be an element of truth in that. But of course, as a politician, you can't say that. Yeah, you, you, you're yeah. immediately arrogant, patronizing, or condescending, so you, you can't say it. You and I are former politicians, that's why we can say it. We can say it to <laughs> this room where nobody's listening. Um, I mean, I was in the government that, that, you know, where we did some very unpopular but necessary things. I mean, the difficult things around the budget. I happened to be, you know, it was my choice, but I was put in charge of the department that was responsible for universities, and therefore the tuition fee stuff was, was on my desk. Um, and it made us hated by a lot of people, but it had to be done. I mean, the universities were going but um, Some decisions had to be made, even if it meant abandoning pledges that are being made in opposition. Um, and right now, you know, the, the, the Chancellor's talking tough about um, we're going to have some very difficult decisions to be made on Thursday, but we know that the, the, the really hard things um, are not going to be done. I mean, a good example would be the revaluation of council tax. Every politician knows oh, it's a complete disaster. Local government is being infantilized because they don't have a revenue base. But to have a proper revenue base, you need to base property prices on current market prices, not what they were 30 years ago. But to do that would create a lot of losers. And all the losers will you know, be outraged. And so you lose a powerful constituency of support. Um, so in, in many ways, we do have this problem that the public wants politicians who will tell it straight and do difficult things, but when they do, they will be angry and outraged and vote against them. So. There is a European politicians who said, I know exactly what I have to do. I just don't know how to get reelected once I do. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there is, on the other hand, um, a separate reality, which is, 
if you do something which is unpopular and you seem out of touch, as we say, you don't seem to understand that people don't like it, then you get voted down and you get criticized. But what at least what the people that I used to work with, the media people, told me that every time you're going to say something that is unpopular, you should preface your statement by saying, I am aware that this is unpopular. So at least you are viewed as somebody who understands that the voters don't like it. Yeah. And uh, I know that you're not going to like this. However, I'm going to say this because this is the right thing. It doesn't work all the time, but at least um, two more bits and we will open it up to, uh, to a conversation with, with the audience. Uh, in most countries or in many countries, there isn't such a sharp distinction as there is in the UK between politicians and civil servants. You know, it's more of a blob. Um, advisors are civil servants, but sometimes advisors become politicians, they run for office. It's much more fluid. In this country, it is not an ironclad distinction, but most civil servants are civil servants and politicians are not career civil servants. What's it like on a daily basis when you're a cabinet minister and you've got civil servants and, you know, in any meeting is going to be very political, but the politicians are supposed to opine on politics, the civil servants are not. But I cannot imagine the civil servants are entirely silent on politics because they wouldn't be part of the conversation. How does it work in practice? Well, I think what makes it work in practice are these people who I described as special oh, advisors. I see. Those are the, the middlemen, the middle women. The middlemen between right. the civil service and the politician, the political head. Um, and the, the problem is that the more special advisors you create, the effectively you're politicizing the civil service. And, uh, you know, one of the worries about British politics in recent years, you know, various people like Michael Gove um, pushing to have more and more politically appointed civil servants. I actually rather, I think the British system is excellent. Um, and, you know, we do have, in general, a very high quality civil service. You know, they all vote and they all have political opinions. And sometimes the political opinions come through. But my experience of, you know, having run a very big government department for five years is that the level of integrity mm -hmm. and political independence of senior civil servants was outstanding. Uh, I mean, they're not here, so I'm not saying it's a flat. Well, they could be. We, we, we train 30, 40 of them each year in the EMPP, so they have to be outstanding. But I think, I think with the special advisor system, the... the the, the, the people who do the hard negotiation right. between political heads are right. in, in the coalition between two parties right. um, are, are crucial in some Egypt because otherwise um, the civil servants are by default uh, doing political tasks. And I think you do need that buffer uh, to protect them. And last but not least, I'm going to go off piste here, but I cannot resist. I have to ask this question. This is a country with strong fiscal institutions, with lots of, you know, uh, enlightened civil servants, with plenty of government entities that can do the kind of thing that I used to do for a living, budget projections, estimates of the impact of a budget, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How can it be that a newly anointed prime minister, a new, newly anointed chancellor, go off, have supper, uh, uh, and in the course of the meal, come up with a mini budget that is completely and totally unconsulted and which is then announced 24 hours later. And, you know, as the cliche goes, the rest is history. How could that possibly happen in a well-run country? Well, it's, it, it isn't well-run. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making that as a party point, but the, the political structures are, in the UK, highly defective, you could say, decayed in many ways. Um, I mean, the, the fact that... The, it effectively, you have a winners take all political system, means that the ruling party has immense power. Well, can I could truly have done. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, if I was a green, I would probably, or even UKIP, I would be saying the same. Um, and there's a, you, you've got a situation over the summer where um, 150,000 people in the Conservative Party were choosing the Prime Minister. And very many of those 150,000 people were UKIP supporters in infiltrate. And it was the same problem that um, the Labour Party had when you had the, the Corbynite takeover. Um, we against roughly the same kind of numbers, so 200,000 to 500,000, you know, the infiltration of a party. So he never got into government. 
But had he got into government, you'd have had the same kind of disaster that trusts us. So uh, the, the problem stems from the fact that we have ex excessive concentration in a single party elected on a first past the first system. Um, you know, other there are many other countries which do the same. I think India is the the only other major country that has a. But, but the United States, of course. Let, 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 let me push back on that a little bit. There are plenty of shortcomings associated with first past the post with uh, single party governments. However, regardless of who happens to be in number ten or in the White House, pick your favorite uh, seat of power. There are presumably state institutions, the civil service, the council for this, and the <coughs> agency for that, who, regardless of who is running things, get to have a say, get to look at the numbers, are consulted, do some projection, do all the things that we teach students here to do, right? Simulations, estimates, regressions, uh, um, all the stuff that presumably is done behind the scenes, but which is essential to us. That that was not done, and that the, the problem might have happened regardless of what the electoral system yeah. is. Well, or, or am I missing something? Well, one explanation which I find fascinating is that um, Liz Truss and her people. She was a Leninist. She was a it was a totally Leninist. Not Leninist. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a revolutionary putsch in effect, which simply swept aside. The top officials in the Treasury, they are fine. They are the Treasury. They completely ignored right. the, the institutions you're describing. Um, and it was a revolutionary bid for power by uh, an organized minority uh, who wanted to impose their revolutionary agenda. I mean, it was from the right, right. rather libertarian right, rather than from the Marxist left. But it, well, that's, just, that's the best analogy I can find. Um, it was a very short-lived revolution. Um, okay, I am tempted to make uh, all kinds of jokes about lettuce, but I shall refrain. Uh, I did find it uh, quite remarkable that the man who got fired from Treasury, who was supposed to be a very thoughtful man, uh, the one who did all simulations, was called Mr. Scholar, right? Um, uh, kind of one of those ironies of history. Um, all right, I have spoken too much. I will not say anything about vegetables. And um, we will take it to Jay, who's right here. You've got the floor for the first question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and of course, we can take questions from uh, people uh, who are zooming in. Um, but let's take a couple from the floor to begin with. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, and thank you, Sir Benz, for, for your presentation. I look forward to reading your book. Um, so I, I want to ask probably a, a quick but linked two-part question. Uh, so I come from India, and I think there are quite a few barriers to entry to politics with just starting to get uh, a ticket to run for office, right? So there's there's the dynastic politics issue, there's corruption, and there, there are a whole bunch of other factors that, that tie into it, right? And you spoke about understanding the political missionary and understanding the party mechanisms itself as, as one of the key uh, lessons. Uh, so the, the first question was, could you please elaborate a little more or, or speak to having a difference of opinion with your political superiors across various levels, right? So if you stand for something that looks slightly different or looks entirely different to other members of your party, how do you engage in, and deal with that? So that's that's question one. The, the second question was ties to what, what you said with your last slide, which was in relation to learning to kill or be killed. Uh, that almost speaks to not having any space for survivors or floaters, right? So it's the only way is forward or up. Uh, and that almost caters exclusively to a certain kind of person. And does that inherently result in us denying ourselves the opportunity to have other people who might be good politicians or good policy makers who have no chance of running for office as a consequence? So two questions. Thank you. Yeah, so just a couple of uh, remarks to preface my answer, but first of all, when we talk about political corruption, what do we mean? Um, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in India, as it happens. Um, people talk about corrupt politics, and there are some corrupt people, you know, but th there is, they have a fundamental problem, which is what happens. How do you have a democracy in an extremely populous country like India, where every constituency has a million residents, right? Now, to campaign um, as an MP in an Indian constituency, you need vast sums of money. And otherwise, you can't get around, you can't give them literature, 
whole big rallies, this kind of thing. You need lots and lots of money. So where do you get the money from? Right? You've got to raise it from, um, you can't get it from the government. Um, there are a lot of poor people, so you're not going to get it from mass membership. So you go to people who can give you money, which will tend to be sympathetic business people who will usually want something in return, right? Now, we call that corruption, but a lot of corruption in India is about raising money to do politics rather than raising money to put in a Swiss bank account <laughs> and get votes. But I think when we talk about corruption, we need to make a bit of a distinction between those two. Um, the, the, there was um, an Indian prime minister, I think it was Rao, who was caught carrying suitcases full of rupees from his house to an office and was denounced as a corrupt politician. But as far as we know, it was entirely connected with party funding, had nothing to do with his personal bank balance. And I think the other point about um, India, and I think it's to a lot of other countries, um, which is a very powerful corrective to um, bad politics, which we don't have here, is that poor people vote and they take their voting seriously. And you can see, you know, people queuing the sun for a, a day. Um, and they think very carefully about how to use their vote tactically more than people here do, actually. Um, and, and if you're a very poor person in a poor country, your vote has agency. It's the one time in your life when you can actually make a difference. Whereas in India, the people who abstain are the middle class, you know, and the rich. You know, why would you bother to vote? You know, you're one vote in a million in Bombay East, so why, why turn out? You know? So, so it, it is driven very much by the politics and the interests of poor people. Um, you know, things have happened in the last five or ten years with Modi and the BJP, which perhaps less edifying than, yes. than we would hope, but, but I, I think basically, you know, India is a wonderful example of a, of a vibrant democracy. You met other countries like Kenya, actually, which is where I started my professional work, working for Jomo Kenyatta, senior. Um, and, and again, you have the, the same phenomenon, a lot of corruption, but a lot of it political. Uh, and, you, you know, poor peasant farmers who actually can make a difference through their voting and take it very, very seriously and value the vote. Tribute to Indian democracy, I like that. Uh, in the back there. So the first question is, as you talked about uh, aligning yourself with loyal uh, allies in the political system, so firstly, how do you find uh, the set of loyal people? Uh, secondly, what are the char characteristics you look in a loyal person, or it's just pure gut feeling? And thirdly, it's a hypothetical question. Would you say that Shashi Tharoor would make a good heir to become the next PM for India? <laughs> Can you repeat the last the last one, because we couldn't quite hear it. Yeah. Uh, it's a hypothetical question. Would you say that Shashi Tharoor would make a good heir to the next uh, to become the next PM for India? We have to opine on Indian politics, which we may or may not want to do. Shashi <laughs> Tharoor. Can you who that person is? So, so Shashi Tharoor is uh, a member of parliament from Kerala, was a former undersecretary yeah. to Kokiana in the UN, but he just recently lost the vote to become the head of Congress Party to a career politician called Madhukarjan Karge. So, yes. this would be thank you. Which is renewal in Congress, in the Congress Party. Yes, well, it's, you know, the dynasty has died. I mean, the, you know, I've, I've met Rajiv Gandhi, and, you know, the guy is not. Lots of big figure. And Doing well with the current. Right, right. I'm not really proud of that. Uh, you know, they, they, they pursued the dynastic politics too far. Um, but, you know, the country desperately needs a kind of secular opposition which is coherent uh, and has got a, you know, simple social democratic platform, which is what the Congress Party used to have. But well, who, who it does it, I, I, I can't possibly tell you. Um, the first was how do you find trustworthy people? How do you find trustworthy? Yeah. Well, you you basically that's where political parties 
come in handy. I mean, if I'm interviewing for a, a special advice, you know, they would have to give some evidence that, you know, they've worked for the party, they've been out in helping in by-elections, they've worked for other MPs. So, so you, you, you've got to pin people you can draw on. Um, trustworthiness isn't entirely equated with being part of the same party, but it, it does narrow down the pool of talent. And you, you know, you learn by doing. I mean, I've worked for wonderful, I, I had a team of people in Twickenham who worked for me for 20 years, were totally loyal. Um, but I had one or two other people who, who were, you know, mm. dreadful. Um, and that's, uh, that's it's about personnel management. Yeah. You, 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 you do learn these things. Oh, some of the most effective politicians are not necessarily trustworthy, but you want to, want, you know, what's the old cliche? You want your enemies up close. Uh, that's not entirely irrelevant. Uh, yeah, uh, in the red there. Um. Okay. I was just wondering your opinion on um, Matt Hancock going into the jungle. Uh, do you think it's like because you've been on Strictly, so I was wanting to know: Do you think these kind of moves are to humanise politicians, as he says, or it's to kind of redeem his? Well, his I think the exit? problem the problem with Matt Hancock was was twofold. First of all, he abandoned Parliament, and he's supposed to be doing a job representing people. And the second, he took large sums of money for doing so. Um, and that's why, uh, in, in addition, he, he wasn't a popular figure as health Stone Christian, but that's a different story. Um, as you rightly say, I, I, I did a bit of this myself. I mean, I, I think I was the only cabinet minister who's ever been on Strictly Come Dancing, but I, um, but I was only on for the winter show. I mean, I had six sessions with the professional dancer to learn the routine. Um, it didn't disrupt my work. I wasn't paid, so I just be right. But, but you know, a lot of people, including my party leader, were highly disapproving. Um, but most of my colleagues were very envious. Get part of the competition. Uh, no, I just didn't. But I, I, <laughs> but I got a 10 from the head judge, sir. <laughs> Visibility is very uh, important in politics. Woman right next to uh, Brenda, yes. I thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so it seems like being an MP is an incredibly difficult job and you're not necessarily getting a lot of money for it. So I was wondering, why did you choose to do it? Why do you think most of your colleagues do it? And do you think that most people despise petition because they think that they're doing it for the wrong reasons? Well, um, it, it's often said that we would get better politicians if we paid them a lot of money. Uh, and I don't buy that, actually. Um, there are a lot of people, particularly, I, I guess, more in the Conservative Party, who could be earning a lot more doing other things. They've come from a business background. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of, for a lot of people in Parliament, the current salary, which I think is 85,000, is extraordinarily large. You're just doing an ordinary menial job, or even being a school teacher or a nurse. I mean, it's a, it's a fortune. So, um, nor is there any evidence that I've seen that fewer and fewer people are trying uh, to, to become politicians. Whenever there is a safe seat which comes up for one of the major parties, you know, dozens and dozens of people are applying. It's a very highly competitive process. Um, but I think the point you make, um, which is about the risk reward calculus that MPs may, you know, you, you are taking, um, you know, a financial risk. You're basically going in for other reasons. It may be ambition or a wish to do good, but but you are arguing, you, you know, you do believe that money is a secondary consideration. And, and I just reinforce the point I made earlier, um, that a lot of people spend a lot of money trying to become an elected politician and get nowhere. I mean, I... I'm not sure I should set this example because it's somebody in my family, but I have a, a very ambitious um, member of my family who seen that I'd been in politics and wanted to do the same. But he, he's a different party, Labour, and he went to live in the north of England uh, specifically to uh, put down roots in a seat he knew where the MP was going to be returning in five or ten years' time. 
and devoted his life to it. To, mm, took his children out of school, got a job he didn't particularly want. Uh, and he, he was the Dauphin, you know, he was he was going to get the seat. Um, and then something happened, wasn't as well organized as he could be. They had a selection meeting and he was narrowly defeated. And he's now asking himself, why, why did I spend 10 years of my life doing this? Um, so, you know, there, there is a cost, there is a reward, there is a, a penalty attached to being um, pursuing political office. And if and I it's, not, it's not dealt with, I think, by just paying out fees. If I can just follow up on that, you mentioned in your introductory remarks that you ran five times before you became an MP. So what kept you going? You lose once, bad luck, you least lose twice. Mm. Third time, I'll get it. You kept on going. How come? Yeah. Well, I think it sounds a little bit sentimental, but uh, I, I think a lot of it has to do with a supportive uh, spouse. You know, my wife had um, put up with me going off to political campaigning for years. Um, and I think she took the view, well, you know, we're not going to waste all that. You know, just keep going until it comes right. Um, and even when she 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 had cancer and, and eventually, and I could have just dropped out and become a carer, but she insisted that I kept going. Um, so I, I think one of the unquantifiable things in all political careers, actually, is the partnership um, with your with your spouse, whoever it is. And I've actually I've produced another book, which um, is a bit of a niche publication which is called uh, Partnership and Politics in a Divided Decade, which I did jointly with my, my second wife, my, my first wife died. Uh, and it's, it is a combination of my narrative and her diaries, which she kept throughout the coalition years and subsequently. And I'm, I suppose I'm making the point that although I was the figurehead, the, the front man, she was just as important as I was in terms of my political career. Uh, and, and I think many, many politicians um, are, are in that position. Others, you know, unfortunately don't have it, and, or they mess it up by Matt Hancock with his stupid um, products in front of the CCTV camera. <laughs> uh, I've run for office twice, my wife, I'm not sure we would go for number three, let alone five. Um, but I did give her a copy of your book, the one you wrote with your wife. Uh, um, I had given the floor to the gentleman in the back, and he, you know, he lost the microphone in an earlier round. So uh, now he's got her again. That's politics. Floor is yours. Uh, a broad question about media. How should we be prepared to deal with media before and during our political career, especially before? Should we already kind of think about in 10, 15 years about our tweets, our, our pictures on Instagram and Facebook? How, how can we deal with that? Um, well, I, I don't attach too much importance to the rise of social media. A, a lot of politicians say that, you know, all the ills of today are caused by the fact that we no longer have print press and we now have Facebook and Twitter. And I, I don't, don't buy that at all. I mean, it, it's it's basically just one of the additional skills you've got to, got to get. And if you don't do it... Um, you know, you, you, you're not going to succeed. Uh, I, I, although I think, you know, Trump was a loathsome individual, you, you have to admire as a professional politician his phenomenal skill at using uh, his Twitter account. He had absolutely amazing skill. And he just he had this ability to use invective and short, snappy phrases to build a whole political platform that was amazingly successful for a long time. So, you know, you've just got to learn to do it. You, you can't complain about it. I mean, the one new negative element of the social media in politics is the anonymity that it gives to political attack. Under traditional, you know, partisan politics, you know, you'd have a lot of give and take, um, um, badinage in a public meeting, and a good politician would learn a good put down. Um, but, but you know, if you're trolled on a, a social media account, you have no idea who's doing it. They can be very vicious. 
uh, and it's been a particular problem with women MPs uh, who are threatened with sexual assaults and violence, and they've got no comeback. They don't know who's doing it. Uh, I suppose the simplistic answer is, you know, get on to output mode, uh, listening to the input. You, you, in a way, you can't do that. You've got to engage with it. Uh, there is a piece of legislation going through Parliament at the moment governing content uh, on social media that hopefully will deal with some of that. But that's the one downside. You spoke about Donald Trump in the past tense. I very much wow. hope you're right. Um, we have um, we've been focusing on that side of the room, so I'm going to move over to this side of the room. Um, right there. Your two guys are sitting next to each other. You can ask two questions for the price of one, as long as you keep them brief. Yes, both of you. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did you, who's going to go first? I got to go. <laughs> um, hi, hi, Ivans. Um, you've obviously had a very successful political career, but do you have any regrets um, of going into politics? And hand over the microphone to your neighbor there. <laughs> Hi, um, so I just had a question about uh, legitimacy, because obviously I would be interested in becoming a plumber in the future, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and um, as we can see, kind of plumber. <laughs> yeah, so as we can see background matters, which implies social reproduction and kind of nepotism. So there's a lack of empathy towards the whole population. I was wondering, how do you make sure that you keep this type of empathy? And I know that you like delegate and have people who advise you, etc. So how do you choose the normal? How do you know that the knowledge that you're using is actually like legitimate? And uh, yeah, just about representation and, you know, actually helping everyone and not just one social group. So the first again, sorry, that's my... Uh, first question again. I don't just age you. Well, you've had any regrets? Oh, yeah, I no, I I don't, and I and I'm glad in retrospect that I did it the way around that I did because I was able to bring up a family and reach my kids, and you know a lot of my colleagues who were younger didn't, you know they just missed that stage of life. So I I don't regret the um, way I did it. Um, I'd made mistakes and terrible mistakes, you know, you, you do. Um, it's partly why I put the item on the board about managing mistakes is one of the key arts of government. But, I mean, I did, did some really bad things, for, for sure. Um, you, you, in a hurry, under pressure, uh, you, you, you make bad mistakes. I, I think, you know, going back to economic policy at the moment, the one big mistake I made in government was um, I had argued from the outset that government during the austerity years should not be cutting public investment and I had an ongoing argument with Osborne about it. But I lost the argument and I probably should have resigned or took a stand on it. But I, you know, I took the view, well, nobody will understand the argument. I just keep on doing what I'm doing. But, but I, you, you do realise in retrospect that you know, you have made mistakes, but, you know, politics is managing them and moving on. And the, 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 the wider point about how do you maintain empathy, was that right? Um, I mean, it's terribly difficult. I mean, it, but it's interesting when you look at the current lineup of political leaders in the UK. Um, one thing that strikes me as a fellow politician, not a recent one, it was the way in which, which the Chancellor hunts has that ability to empathise through television of a sort of reasonable guy. I mean, actually, he's very privileged. I mean, he was head boy of a top private school, son of an admiral, but actually comes across uh, as somehow mastered that art of being able to empathise with the audience and sound reasonable and sympathetic. Um, I feel that the new prime minister probably doesn't have that somehow, but but maybe I'm being unfair and trust didn't have it at all. <laughs> so it's it's it, it, it's partly built into your personality, but it is something learned, I think, the ability to listen to people, to get feedback, to uh, talk to people in in a way that, that that they understand you're listening to them. It's it's a it's a very subtle political art. 
I think we have a question from the Zoom group. Karina, is that um yes? Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna read the couple of questions. Um, one it's uh, from Alexander Maffey, a master's student in health policy. That he asked, uh, what politicians can learn from doctors to garner more public trust. Good and if I make another question, well, uh, I mean, it, you know, I think it amazes me actually. What? Why are doctors top of the list? I mean. You had that doctor in Lancashire who murdered 400 people or something. We hear every week of <laughs> catastrophes in hospitals and in, um, children dying because of incompetent or um, cruel doctors. Um, you know, there's a litany of disasters, which is a, at least as bad as the disasters in the politics profession. But uh, I, I think it's because, um, you know, doctors, teachers, University professors. Give me, oh, we, don't, we don't get the same kind of good press. I think that's yeah, very yeah, unfair. But it is, you know, it is a defined profession with defined standards. You know, they, they, they all treat the Hippocratic oath. Right. The idea that you spent five years studying to get where you are, passed exams, satisfied a professional body. And politics doesn't have that. There, there is no when you when you go into parliament or want to become a candidate, there's no booklet you can get. How do I become a good successful politician? When I when you go to become an MP for the first time, there's nobody telling you what to do. Right? It's it's that it's that lack of boundaries, rules, clarity, qualification, which I think makes it as being fundamentally different from. Um, one of the traditional trusted professions. One more question from the um, from the Zoom audience. You had another one, right? So this is from uh, Toby Chambers. Um, uh, he asked, uh, "You discuss from a party perspective, but voters are dissoluted with political parties. Uh, are we political parties becoming? Are political parties becoming irrelevant? Are political parties becoming irrelevant?" Well, political parties are a way of organizing opinion. Um, uh, I can't see any other way. I mean, you can, you can have politics that is totally personalized, um, and the American presidential system has elements of that. I mean, Trump wasn't really a Republican. He was just a, an outsized personality who wanted to become president. So that wasn't a kind of party-driven phenomenon. But of course, American politics is highly partisan on party lines. Um, I mean, the British system has operated, as I said, with three parties over 200 years. And anybody trying to become an independent or a breakaway faction never, ever succeeds. Now, why is that? Um, it's partly um, the way that the first part of the system winnows out small uh, breakaway groups. Um, it's the, the cost, getting a critical mass of organization. Um, and it's building up a, a sort of history of recognition, brand recognition. Um, you know, the vast majority of the public are not terribly interested in politics. They don't have a deep um, interest in or commitment to political parties, but they, they, they will identify with a brand and one or two things that they associate with the Labour Party, the Tory Party, the in America in a more intense way. So I, I, I can't think of any other sensible way in which you would organize opinion. Certainly buildings around personalities will leave you exposed to highly capricious behavior, um, megalomaniacs who will not leave office when they're required to. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of a successful democracy that doesn't have. Yeah. Parties are very places. easy to hate, but we can't do without them, I think, is a fair summary. So we're out of time, but I'm going to use Terra's privilege to ask two very, very short, very, very pointed questions. And these are not about policy mistakes, they're about personal experiences. Worst, most painful, most embarrassing moment, and best, most exhilarating moment in your personal political yeah. career. Gosh. Um, well, I think the worst period I had was I picked a fight with Mr. Rupert Murdoch. Uh -huh. Some of you may remember, but I, um, 
what happened was that I was having my weekly advice surgery, which is where people come with their blocked drains. Right. And there was a couple of young women who wanted to see me and told me that they were constituents, though they weren't. They they forged their names and address. Um, and they'd had hidden microphones uh, tucked down their front. Um, and they got me talking. I, I, I was in a generally excited state. We were having riots of uh, tuition fees and stuff. So I wasn't in a very stable mind. Uh, and I started sounding off about all the things that I was doing and liked and disliked. And I hit on Mr. Rupert Murdoch because I was at that time having to make a decision as to whether to refer his takeover of B Sky B to the competition authorities. And I had actually done it, but um, I, I sounded off as well. And this was strictly against the ministerial code um, because you're supposed to be in a quasi-judicial capacity. Anyway, the following day, you know, my voice was heard on national radio. Um, the tape recording had gone public and I was acting completely improperly and people were trying to kick me out of the government, but I was thought to be sufficiently important um, to hang on. But it was a terrible time. And it was made worse by the fact that there were about 100 journalists camping outside my suburban semi detached house in Twickenham, uh, trying to take photographs from 6 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and it, it was a pretty torrid period. But, you know, I lived through it. And, um, and that was that. Um, in, in terms of the, the highs, actually, um, so some of the highs, again, it sounds perhaps a bit mushily sentimental, but, but when you've actually delivered for an individual, a, a, a genuine, you, you know, you actually got somebody um, a house, you know, which otherwise wouldn't have happened if you hadn't intervened, or you've sorted out somebody's asylum case, so instead of being deported back to the Congo or wherever they, they they stayed, you know, and you've done it. It was your intervention that did it. And I I, I got a bigger kick out of that kind of thing than, than getting a round of applause in, in, a, in a party meeting. But but in terms of the political um, you know, high points, uh, when I became party leader, we, we did have a very highly successful, we, we recovered some of our popularity from the awful days of the end of the coalition. And in the European elections, um, we got up to 20 odd percent public opinion and got a record breakthrough in European elections. But then, of course, we lost the Brexit argument and all those hopes turned to ashes. So let us excise the last bit about hopes turning to ashes and let us simply think that uh, there's a lot of hope we had in politics, and I think Sir Vince Cable is a very good example of uh, what polit politics can be and what politics can accomplish. So please join me.